First of all, this class is about viscous flows, right? Last lecture, we talked about conservation of mass, momentum, and energy. And one of the critical terms that maybe a lot of the previous classes on fluid dynamics you've taken that skims over is the viscous stress. And in this lecture, we'll dive into the viscous stress and analyze what it is and uh, uh, where it comes from, why is it like uh, what it is, and give a specific example on the effect of that viscous stress. All right. So let's start with uh, uh, what we learned in the last lecture, which is the decomposition of, uh, of the velocity gradient tensor. Because the viscous stress is a function of the velocity gradient tensor, right? By, by the law of uh, Galilean invariance, the viscous stress tensor shouldn't be a function of the velocity itself. So if you, for example, if you think of a, a box, so I'm going to use the dotted line to represent a box in three dimensions. This is at t equal to zero, and imagine how the box is going to move and deform at a later time. So it's going to move and deform to something like this, let's say. Let's just uh, pose an example, all right? So what we are going to be doing is we are going to, uh, we are going to decompose the movement into multiple components. So the first component is just a, a solid, is just a, a shift, like a solid body. So we are just a moving the box to another new location. So this is the component that takes away, that should be ignored in any construction of the viscous stress tensor because of Galilean invariance. So let's say this is equal to a summation of different parts. Now the second part is rotation. The second part is rotation. And rotation is basically, I start from this and I'm gonna rotate into a different angle while keeping the whole thing just uh, looking like a solid body, right? And we discussed that mathematically. What component in the velocity strain tensor does rotation correspond to? The off di just the off diagonal? The anti-symmetric off diagonal component, exactly. So, so this is the anti symmetric component of the velocity strain tensor. Okay, so, so we know this part has no, con the, the first part has no contribution. Now, does the anti-symmetric part has any contribution to the viscous stress tensor? That's the first thing we want to discuss. All right, so from the previous class you've taken, do you know the answer to this question? Does rotation contribute to a rotational viscous stress tensor? Does the anti-symmetric part of the, of the velocity strain tensor contribute to an anti-symmetric part of the viscous stress tensor? The answer is no, right? Because we know the viscous stress tensor is symmetric and it has nothing to do with the rotation. From one intuitive aspect, you can think of that uh, if, you, if, you have a, if you have a fluid that rotates like a solid body, there shouldn't be any internal stress caused by the solid body rotation. But that's from an intuitive understanding. But there is another argument that there should not be any anti-symmetric part in the viscous stress tensor at all. Why is that the case? Why shouldn't there be any anti-symmetric part? Do you have an answer? Uh, if I remember correctly, uh, <coughs> correct me if I'm wrong, the opposite sense that has to be symmetric, and that the shape has to be not to be Okay. Yeah. I think you you have a very good point. So let me. Let me, f let me follow your line of thinking, and uh, uh, I'm, going to, uh, I'm going to use another color. 
No, that's not. Uh, can I do that? Oh, no, it doesn't work. Okay, so let me. All right. So let me draw a very small segment of fluid. All right. So, so let's just consider the anti-symmetric part of the viscous stress tensor, just um, uh, on one on one component. So let's say the x y component, and let's look straight in into the x y plane. Okay. So let's consider a box. First question, on which of the faces does the XY component of the viscous stress tensor act? Huh? Yeah, XY component. Does it act on the XY face? So it acts in the component in the on the face that is perpendicular to x, but in the component of y. That's right. Okay. So so what you are saying is it acts on this face, right? But it gives a force in the y direction. So what is the magnitude of this force on this interface? So let's say I have a tau x y times area. So let's say the uh, all the th size of this box is L. So the area is going to be L squared, right? Okay. Now what is the about this face? This face is also perpendicular to x, right? It's going to be going down because the surface normal is the other direction. So I'm going to have another force pointing exactly at the opposite direction. Now what is the resulting torque? on this small solid element. What? Right, tau xy times L cubed. So this is the force, and the force is opposite direction, and they are spaced at a distance of L. So this is the, this is the force times L, that's the torque, right? Okay, and you can see that the torque is proportional to L cubed. How about the moment of inertia of this small cube? How does that scale with L? It's L to the power of 4. That's right. The inertia, the linear inertia is L cubed, right? The rotational inertia is a proportion, it's the unit should be L cubed uh, times L. So it's rho L cubed times L. There is a constant depending on the shape of this uh, uh, for a box, I don't remember what it is, but it should be a constant times rho L to the fourth. Okay, so now I have a force that scales, I have a torque that scales L to the cube, acted on a small box whose rotational inertia scales with L to the fourth. Does that ring a bell to you? Does that pose a problem? goes to infinity, that's right. So if I have an infinitesimal force, an infinitesimal box, this has a problem because I would get an infinite acceleration in the rate of rotation. Unless, unless what? There is a balancing force, exactly. So the real torque I get on this, on this is the composition of uh, the force on these two faces and also on these two faces. So the torque I, the real torque I get is not only this term but also minus tau y x times l square times another l, right? It works the same. So the only way for me to get non-infinite acceleration in the rate of, rot rate of rotation of that small volume is that I have to exactly balance tau xy and tau yx. So that is why this, the viscous stress tensor cannot have any anti-symmetric component. Okay, and the result is that the rotation has no contribution to the viscous stress tensor. 
That also holds for translation. Are you talking about uh, the the fact that this tau x y should be nearly the same on these two different faces? Yeah. Right, right. They have to be so to be rigorously speaking, the tau x y has to be differentiable with respect to uh, with respect to x in order for the resulting acceleration to be finite, right? Otherwise, you get an infinite acceleration on that fluid element. All right. All right. Okay. So we have two components of the movement of a local fluid, and both of them has nothing to do with viscous stress. All right. Already. Now, what's what's next? We have taken away the linear rotation, a uh, linear ex linear translation. We have taken away a rotation. What is left is exactly is the symmetric part of the velocity gradient tensor, right? So now, if you write a symmetric matrix, three by three matrix, how many degrees of freedom do you have in this three by three matrix? Nine. Yes, if you consider a general matrix, it's nine. But if you consider symmetric. Six, right so we have six degrees of freedom okay and we can further decompose this six degrees of freedom into the off diagonal components and diagonal components and there are six diagonal components and six off diagonal components so let's consider the diagonal components first the diagonal component is basically taking that box and Either, elong either elongate or shrink each component, uh, shrink each axis, right? So, so if I have a x x component, this is basically saying that if it's positive, then I'm stretching in the x direction. If it's negative, I'm squeezing the x direction. And so does y and z directions. Okay, so let's just uh, write it down. And also the off diagonal components. So what the off diagonal components do can be illustrated by only considering two axes. The off-diagonal components, it has three independent uh, components, x, y, y, z, and, uh, and x, z, right? So each is a pair of axes. So it can be looked at uh, by and looking at just uh, one pair of axes, for example, x, y. Uh, let's be consistent. That's just a y and x. So a positive contribution in the x-y component means that as you go in the x direction, the y velocity increases. So that is a stretching like this in like a diamond way. Right? So if you go along the x-axis, the, the y velocity increases. Therefore, after a moment of time, the y has shifted up. Right? So the element has shifted up. So if you go in the y direction, it's the, the position has been shifted in the in the horizontal direction. It's that way. And this is this is replicated for x, y, x, z, and y, z. All right. Okay. So what it turns out is that you can further decompose the diagonal components into two things, and one of the things is going to be turn out to be equivalent in a rotational frame of reference, the off diagonal terms. So first of all, you can decompose that into a pure dilation. So you're going to decompose that to a isotropic dilation. So basically, in all three axes, it's going to be the, the fluid is going to expand at exactly the same rate. And then the other component is a volume preserving diagonal uh, dilation and shrinking. So it's hard to draw that here, but like basically, you if you sh if you elongate in one axis, you have to shrink on the other axis to make sure the volume is exactly the same. 